a very sad room. It's um, as a widow's room in the 17th century would have been, completely draped in black. Widows spent a lot of money on cloth to um, actually demonstrate their mourning. And for every stage in a woman's life in early modern Europe, there were clear expectations as to how she should behave. And these were usually justified by biblical figures. There was a whole literature associated with widows who could, to some, seem a threateningly independent group. Widows' handbooks, often called mirrors for widows, were mostly written by clergymen. Exemplary behavior was also set out in the many funeral sermons, printed and widely read as devotional literature, which contained descriptions of women's lives and their virtuous conduct. The ideal widow was encouraged to separate herself from society, remain loyal to the memory of her husband, and spend the rest of her days caring for her children and praying for her own spiritual welfare and that of others. The reality of widowhood was often very different, however. For poorer members of society, it could bring ruin. And very often, the only course open to a widow was to remarry as soon as her period of mourning was over. For the artisan and burger classes, carrying on the family business, even if the widow was perfectly well able to run it herself, was often legally dependent on having a man in charge who could be admitted to the proper guild. Marrying a widow was often the entry ticket into wealth and status for a man. In the wonderful surroundings here at Scorehood, we are more concerned with <coughs> not becoming a widow meant for aristocratic and royal women, whose biblical role models were often more aggressive than those of their more lowly counterparts. Very often, aristocratic and royal widows were compared to the biblical heroines Esther and Judith, for example. For the upper classes, and especially in marriages between ruling houses, provisions for widowhood were a central part of the negotiation of marriage contracts. Money and property had to be set aside by the husband's family to guarantee that on his death, the bride would be well provided for. The state of these properties and the incomes from them were of great concern to the women involved, even when their husbands were alive. They were often involved in managing, expanding, and improving them. In the end, however, when widowhood came, much depended on whether the terms of the marriage settlement could actually be enforced, and that itself depended on many factors the general political and economic situation and the family fortunes were the most obvious, but also whether the widow was respected and liked by her new family, whether her birth family could or was willing to help her enforce her claims, and whether she had children or not. These were all factors which could influence whether she became involved in long legal wrangling about money and property. <coughs> but widowhood was not just a matter of finances and property. It was also a question of status and place within the fabric of society and the family. The transition from wife to widow was a difficult one, especially as it could mean a painful loss of prestige. For a queen or a duchess, unless she was, unable to, unless she was able to become regent for an underage son, it meant adjusting to the role of dowager and taking second place to the new ruler's wife. In aristocratic and courtly circles, one's place in society was clearly and visibly marked by who was allowed to walk through the door first, who sat where at table, and where people sat or stood in church or during audiences and other ceremonies. All of the positions the widow had once enjoyed usually had to be given over immediately to the new queen or the new duchess. 
as one German court theorist wrote, where as the ruler's, where as the ruler's wife she had once given commands, a widow suddenly found that she only had the right to ask politely for what she for what she wanted. Emotionally, these were very difficult times, especially if the relations between the widow and her daughter-in-law, the new queen or female head of the family, were not good. There was a very special constellation in Sweden in the middle of the 17th century that made the situation for Queen Hedwig Eleonora, the consort of Kaiser X Gustav, highly untypical in Europe. When the king died, Hedwig Eleonora was only 24 years old, and she had only one child, a son who was not very healthy. She was a foreigner and did not come from a royal family, but only a ducal one. And therefore she could not rely on her German relatives to strengthen her status. Her position at the outset of her new role as widow was therefore not necessarily good. However, she turned out to be one of the most successful dowager queens in Europe, with an enormous staying power. What were the factors that contributed to this? For representational purposes, Hedwig Eleonora basically stood alone at the head of the dynasty after her husband died, although her political powers were clearly quite limited. When Hedwig Eleonora had arrived in Sweden as a young bride in 1654, the dowager queen, Maria Eleonora, was living in Stockholm, although she died the next year. Maria Eleonora was not the mother of the king, but of Christina, who had abdicated. So there was no daughter-in-law, mother-in-law situation to complicate her personal relationships with Hedwig Eleonora. Thus, even as a young consort, Hedwig Eleonora differed from many other royal brides in not experiencing conflicts with a mother-in-law who had to make way for a new queen and her household. It was 20 years before she herself was confronted with a daughter-in-law, when her son, Carl XI, succeeded to the throne and then married in 1680. So for 20 years, Hedwig Eleonora had remained the most prominent <coughs> female member of the royal family at court in Stockholm. She had moved from the position of consort to that of co-regent, and thus from a sphere of politics in which she had played the seemingly minor role of the wife and helpmate of the ruling male, to the central role of the embodiment of royal power vested in the ruler, even if she was only fulfilling this role for her son. And this was something that she herself was at pains to stress. Many of the paintings of the queen from this period show her in the role as mother and educator of the young king. It was this ability to portray herself in a nurturing, unthreatening role, which seems to have been one of the factors in her success. Another was the fact that her dower lands made her independently wealthy, and she was able to become a patron of artists and architects and assert her station and importance in a very visible manner. Potential blows to Hedwig Eleonora's status and position were carefully mastered. The first was the accession of her son to the throne in 1672. This was also often a great cause of conflict when a woman regent was forced to give up her political influence to her son as the new ruler. For often enough, these women had become accustomed to ruling and found it very hard to let go, whereas young princes were eager to distance themselves from their mother's control and were often ruthless in sending them away from court. The relationship between the young Swedish king and his mother, however, was carefully staged as harmonious in the coronation ceremonies that took place and in the publications that commemorated the event. As long as the young king remained unmarried, there was little change in he Hedwig Eleonora's role and her status in court ceremony. 
His marriage, however, should have been a different matter. But again, circumstances meant that it was possible for her to retain position and influence even after the arrival of a new queen in 1680. In effect, it was her relationship with, with her son that was so strong, and this was the main factor, and because the new queen was in a relatively weak position, and this momentous event brought little change in her status. The new young Danish queen, Ulrike Eleonora, was confronted by a situation that was much more usual in the lives of foreign brides. She entered an environment that was at first hostile. Her marriage was part of a peace settlement after years of war between two countries in which her own dynasty had been defeated and she was expected to adapt and adjust to find her place. Like Ebba Brahe, widowed women from the aristocracy and on a far larger scale royal widows could pursue very independent lives which led them free to travel and to develop their own cultural and intellectual in interests. Much spoke against remarriage, especially at these high levels of society. And like their more lowly counterparts, aristocratic and royal women often only remarried if they were forced by economic or, per or political circumstance. One thing that definitely spoke against it was the fact that the marriage settlement meant that the dowager's property and incomes were only hers if she did not remarry. Thus a new marriage would have to offer significant incentive. And at the level of high aristocracy and royalty, such offers were very rare indeed. Another thing that <coughs> spoke against remarriage were the dangers of childbirth, which most younger widows were glad to avoid. One German dowager princess summed the situation up very well in a letter when she was being pressured to, to remarry. Quote, at the moment I enjoy good days. I have no worries. I go to bed and get up whenever I want. I go wherever I want to go. I live in peace and harmony with my children and take all my pleasure in them. And I know of nothing which gives me cause from com for complaint. If I took a husband again, then all the worry, effort, and work would start all over again. I would no longer be free. This freedom also meant cultural patronage, and the collections which women like Ebba Brahe and Hedwig Eleonora put together are often difficult to reconstruct nowadays because they were dispersed or put into larger collections at their death. We can, however, be sure that widowhood and the freedom it brought gave them the opportunity to create rooms of their own in which, as they pleased, they read, wrote, studied, and delighted in the objects which sur they surrounded themselves with, such as the ones we see here in Spall. Thank you.